morning. My name is Billy. I'm the lead pastor at Christ Chapel. My name is Rich Holsey, and I pastor a lot of great folks in middle Georgia at our Cochran campus. We are so excited to have you join us this morning for worship. We want you to get up off your couch. We want you to get your praise on in your living room. It's going to be an incredible day. We want you to hit the share button with some friends who need to hear about the Lord today. And let's get this party started. Amen. Father, thank you for another opportunity for us to meet as a family online. God, I pray that your presence would fill every home, every living room. God, that deliverance, salvation, healing, all would take place today. And God, that you would be glorified in our worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. that were centered around classic hymns. I talked about what a friend we have in Jesus. And then last week, we talked about I'll Fly Away. This, mor- this morning, the first song right off the bat, this is Amazing Grace. I want to talk to you just a little bit about Amazing Grace. Uh, in 1772, John Newton wrote the song Amazing Grace. In that first stanza, he uses a phrase, I once was lost but now I'm found. I once was lost, but now I'm found. A little boy and his dad were in the woodworking shop doing a project together. They were in there working diligently uh, on this sailboat. They were building a sailboat together. They crafted it. They carved it out. They glued the the sails and, and painted the boat blue. They'd worked on this boat diligently for months. When they finally finished, they decided they would take it out to the river to see it sail and float and enjoy uh, the work that they had put into it. They go out, they drop the boat in the water, and they're sitting there for a little while just in the window. And he told the story of how the boat was lost. Basically, the store owner said, Son, I'm sorry to hear that, but I bought that boat a couple of days ago off of somebody 
and that boat is for sale. If you want the boat, you can have it, but you'll have to purchase it. That little boy began to dig into his pockets, and he began to pull out some money, and he began to collect the change, and he set it up on the, the, the desk and gave it to the store owner. He bought his own boat back. The story goes on to say that when he finally had that sailboat in his hand, that he clutched it tightly. And he said, you belong to me twice. Once because I made you and twice because I bought you back. And when I think about that story, I think that's what the Lord did. That's what the Lord did for us. He, he created me. He created you. He created all of us. And then we sinned against God. But God, in his love for us, sent his son to Calvary's cross and bought us back. He purchased us with his redeeming blood. Jesus tells a story about a father who had two sons. One of the sons said, I'm ready for my inheritance. I want to get what's mine. I want to go out. I want to live it up. I want to do, I want to live my life. I don't really care about my family. I don't care about you talking to his dad. I just want to go do my own thing. And like some of you and like me, he, li- he, he went out and he lived that he'd been waiting for, longing for. He went out and had his servants bring new shoes for his boy. They brought a ring and placed it over his finger. Don't you know that the finger still had the hog slop and the filth and the dirt still on him? And then he took and placed over the filth of his own son, he took an immaculate robe and put it over his son and covered him. Hallelujah. He said, get the, get the fatted calf. We're going to have a party because my son who was dead is now alive. My son who was once lost is now found. By grace, by grace, at the age of 18, I went one Wednesday night to a service at Harvest Temple Church of God. Many know that at Center Point now in Griffin, I went to that church. I was invited by friends. I came in in my cross country outfit. I had just left practice. I went in, went upstairs. I listened to the youth director's message that night. The next morning, I went home that evening. The next morning, I got up, I went to school. All I could think about was what the preacher, the youth director, had spoke on that evening. And I knew in my heart that I needed God. I knew in my heart without a shadow of a doubt that I was out of relationship with Jesus and I I knew that I needed to ask him into my heart and into my life. All day long, uh, I couldn't even focus on school or anything. At 3.15, when the bell rang and I went out to the student parking lot, I jumped into my... 1984 blue Toyota pickup truck. Man, do I wish I still had that truck. I drove. I knew I couldn't wait to Sunday. I knew I couldn't wait to the following Wednesday. I went over to the church that afternoon, and thankfully, Richie Thompson, who was the youth director that had spoke that evening, he was still in the office, and I told Richie, I said, I know that I need God. I know that I am not in a place where if I died, I would go to heaven. My life does not represent the things of God. I'm out of, I'm out of relationship with the Lord, and I need to ask Jesus into my heart. And Richie Thompson, he prayed a prayer with me. I knelt down, and I began to ask Jesus to forgive my sins. I didn't even realize that the blood of Jesus as I was praying for forgiveness, was washing over me and washing all of my sin away. Listen, I'm talking about amazing grace, but can I just tell you Robert Lowry's old song, Nothing But the Blood, it's a good one too. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Listen, there's a scripture that I read right after I got saved. And this scripture has helped me and I believe it will help you. I read, for by grace you've been saved. This is Ephesians 2 and 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God so that no one can boast. It's not by works. It's not by religion. It's not by human effort. It is by the grace of God and through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. There are many of you this morning, you are in a place where you recognize that you were dead in your sins, that you were lost and undone without God or his son. You were hurting and you were broken, but you've been changed by the grace of God. And I know that there are others that are here this morning watching online. You're not here by accident. You're not here by accident. You say, Rich, I really believe that there's something missing in my life. I'm desperate for something more. Let me tell you what you're desperate for. You're desperate for God. You're in a place where you need a relationship with Jesus because in one moment, one prayer, one Savior, everything can change. When you call on that name, the name that is above every name, Jesus. He hears your prayers. He forgives your sin. And you're made right with God. Not by good works, but by His grace. Somebody that's listening to me this morning, maybe you've never asked Jesus into your heart. This is your day. Maybe you say, Rich, I was once close to God, but like that boat, I've drifted. I turned. I went in a different direction. Old timers used to call it backslidden. Let's just be honest. Some of us need to make a U-turn and come back to God this morning. You say, well, I volunteer in ministry. I tithe. I go to church. You can still be backslidden. You can be like that boat and you can drift off. But I want you to know the Father is calling you home. He's calling you home this morning. You say, Rich, I need His grace. I need His forgiveness. If that's you this morning, I want you to pray this prayer. And then after we pray, you, if you can get on the the Facebook comments and leave us a message or call the office here in Zebulon or Cochrane, however you can reach out to us and let us know that you've prayed that prayer and asked Christ into your heart. We want to pray with you. We want to get to know you. We want to be able to uh, minister to you, maybe send you some resources to help you in your new walk with God. Pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I trust you to forgive me I trust you to change me, to make me new. Jesus, be first in my life. Be my Lord, my Savior. Save me by your grace. Fill me with your spirit so I can follow you and live for you the rest of my life. My life is not my own. I give it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Your mountains are still being moved. Your strongholds are still being loosed. God, we believe. Yes, we can see it. That wonders are still what you do. Bodies are still being raised. Giants are still being slain. God, we believe it. Yes, we can see it. The wonders are still what you do. We are here for you. Come and do what you do. We are here.
Christ Chapel family, uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have been blessed by a worship band today and uh, them leading us in worship, as well as Pastor Rich, who done an amazing job today talking to us about amazing grace that absolutely still blows me away, that the God of the universe who created us and we made such a mess out of it, loves us so unconditionally and continues to invite us back into his presence. It's a beautiful thing. So this morning, I want to just reiterate, dovetail off Pastor Rich and say, if you have never invited Christ into your life, that today is a perfect day to just ask Jesus in. Don't wait. Don't make excuses. Don't say, hey, I got another day or I'll wait till the moment feels right again. Today, according to scripture, is the day of salvation. So say the prayer. Ask him into your heart. Watch your life change for the better. If you're a if you're on your couch this morning and you have your Word of God with you, whether that be a, a written version or a mobile version, it doesn't matter to me, but Genesis chapter 24 is where our text comes from today. And I'm not going to read that entire chapter. It's one of the longest chapters in the Bible. It's a long one. So I'm going to refer to it and kind of just allude to it several times in my sermon this morning. This simply is entitled, if you have a pen and you want to write this down, it's entitled, The Second Mile. Now, I'm not asking you to take a note because I think I'm a great speaker. I'm asking you to write it down because sometime later in your life, you're going to need to re rehash and rehearse what you've heard today. And if you don't write it down, you may lose it. It's kind of like when the farmer went out to sow seeds and he would throw them on the ground. The birds would come in and take them away or they would fall in the thorns. 
if you don't specifically put it in a place to remind you later on, you may lose the opportunity of the harvest that God may put in the ground today with a seed. So write it down. Write down something today that God speaks to you. The second mile. Underneath that, if you want to write something, I'd like for you to just simply put this phrase. The second mile has very little traffic. The second mile has very little traffic. In our culture, most people want maximum return with minimal effort. If you go to a job and you work there long enough, you'll find that most people really do want to have the insurance and the benefits and all the good things that come with being employed, but they only really want to do enough just to stay employed, just, just enough to, to slide by. And unfortunately, I know some believers who kind of work that same hand when it comes to their faith. They're like, I just want to live close enough to the world where I can stay in the kingdom and kind of just slide into heaven and barely make it. Not me. I want to go in sliding, but I want to go in with everything I have, with a surrendered heart, with a surrendered mind, and with a surrendered spirit. He wants all of us. Genesis chapter 24, the second mile. This is a story about Abraham, who was a very wealthy man. Not just in possessions, he did have a lot of cattle. He owned a lot of farmland, owned a lot of riches, but he was also spiritually blessed and wealthy as well. He was a friend of God, and we sang that song in the early 2000s, and we absolutely wore it slap out. I am a friend of God. But he was. He was a friend to Abraham. Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac was born to Abraham and Sarah later on in life, and Isaac was kind of the prized child. He really was. As a matter of fact, God spoke to Abraham and said, hey, when you have Isaac, his descendants, check this out, will be as numerous as the sands on the seashore. That's a lot of babies. That's a lot of stretch marks. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a whole lot of having kids, isn't it? He said, they're going to just be everywhere. And they did. They created this incredible people group that God loved so much. Abraham had lived his life with Sarah. Sarah had passed on. But it was Isaac now who was ready to take on a mate. He was ready to get married. In those times, and still sometimes in foreign countries, instead of somebody falling in love, falling in love and going to the movies and taking somebody out to eat, the family, or the parent rather, would choose who they should marry. It's called arranged marriage. So Abraham had this responsibility with Isaac to find him a soulmate, somebody he could live his life with and love and, and, and do life and grow old together with and Abraham was so busy that he chose Eleazar, who was one of his most prominent, trusted servants, kind of a right-hand man. And he said, Eleazar, I'd like for you to go to a foreign country, and I'd like for you to find Isaac a wife. I, I want you to go find him a good wife. I, I want her to be pretty. I he gave her gave him some stipulations, but he said, I want you to go there and find Isaac, his soulmate. In this scripture that I'm sharing with you today, there's a principle of success. Now, I'm not a prosperity preacher. I believe God does bless us. But there are certain principles in God's word that if we live by them, I believe we live a blessed life. One of those is whatever so a man soweth, he shall also reap. I believe that's a principle. It's a law of God that can't be broken. But today I want to talk to you about a different law, the law of the second mile. The, the, the law that says when I've started with what I have and I use what I got and I've done what I can do, I just do a little bit more. It's the kind of people that employers seek out. It's the kind of people who really want to fall in love with and stay in love with somebody. It's the kind of person they seek out. I don't, I don't want to be married to somebody who just wants to do enough to stay married. I, I want to be married to somebody who is fully devoted to me. I don't want to have employees who say, hey, I'm just going to work when the boss is around, but when the, when the cat is away, the mice will play. Maybe that's what they say. I, I, I want to do life with people who are fully committed, devoted followers of Jesus Christ, who hold nothing back. It's second mile kind of people. And you'll notice that when you're on the first mile, there's a lot of traffic. People who are just doing what is necessary. But when you turn the track and you start the second mile and you begin to do some and then some living, it begins to thin out. The traffic begins to get smaller and smaller the further that you go. He said, I want you to find a woman for Isaac, who is a second mile woman. So Eleazar takes 10 camels, <laughs> smelly, stinky, spitting camels. 
Uh, we've been to Israel several times and some of the ladies on the trip will walk up to those camels that they let us ride and they'll say, they're so cute. No, they're not. They're ugly, ugly animals. If we had humps on our back, do you think anybody would say we were cute? No, no, they, they're ugly. And he has these 10 camels and he travels almost 500 miles to a well outside of a foreign city. There's a gate there and outside of the gate is a well where the women gather during the day and they go and get the drinking water, they get the washing water, they get the water to purify for the cleansing of spiritual reasons. But the women are gathering there and Eleazar has traveled 500 miles to get to this well. He's taken and had a lead rope on nine camels while he's riding the tenth, 500 miles to find a woman for Isaac. When he gets there, he, he, he's never had this responsibility before, so he kind of asks God, he says, how do I do this? How do I find and choose a mate for somebody? So God says, this is what you should do. You should have a fleece. And basically what it means to lay out a fleece is to say, God, would you give me a sign? Would you, would you help me with some wisdom, direction, decision making? See, Eleazar was a kind of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. He was preparing the bride for her husband. And that's what the Holy Spirit is doing with the church today. He's saying, hey, bride, get ready because the groom is going to come back. We call that the rapture in the church and be ready and be prepared. Eleazar says this is the fleece. For the first woman who walks out to this well and offers me a drink of water, says, hey, why don't you refresh yourself? The first woman that does that and also says she will water my camels She's going to be the one. Now, 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 before you think about watering camels, the, the woman who walks out, her name is Rebecca, but, but she, she doesn't have a hose pipe. She, she doesn't have a dish to put it in. They had traveled 500 miles. So the dash on these camels is blinking empty. Uh, an empty camel can drink 25 gallons so, so let's do the math. If you have some five-gallon buckets, it would take five of them. Simple math, right? It would take five five-gallon buckets to water 25 gallons. And that would just be one camel. So if she's at a well and she's drawing with a bucket and she raises up a gallon at the time, she's got a have five buckets to fill this one, five to fill this one, five, five, and five. And when she's done that, she still has nine camels to go. What Eleazar saw immediately was this, that this woman, she's beautiful according to Genesis 24. This woman is not only a good-looking woman, she's a second-mile woman. See, there was a custom in the East, it was an expectation that you would offer somebody water. It was called the law of hospitality. If a stranger came by, you offered them water. But you didn't offer to gas up all the camels. He was so impressed with her. He, he was overwhelmed. He said, this is the one. A woman who would walk out. She had no idea that Eleazar represented the most eligible, wealthiest bachelor in the region. She, she wasn't doing this because she thought she was going to get something in return. She was doing it because it was who she is. It was just her nature to do something kind. It was in her to go the second mile. It was in her to do the and then some. I think we need a generation of people who say, I'm not just going to do enough to get by. I'm going to do and, some, some, and then some. I'm going to go the second mile in whatever God asked me to do. He says that we work. Whatever you do in life, as unto the Lord. He doesn't want choppy, insincere work out of us. He wants us to get our hands dirty and get on the second mile and to do something great. And you can imagine her, beautiful woman. Her hair is suddenly in her face. Her mascara is running. Her pantyhose have got rips in them. This is not Chanel number five. This is manure number six. Do you hear me? This is not a good place to be in. She says, none of that stuff matters because I'm a second mile woman. And I'll do whatever it takes to do a job 
and to do a job well. Man, don't we want to have people like that in, in our life? She was judged by her standard of work. She didn't say this is a lousy job and I don't want to do it. She didn't say, I'm just flipping burgers and making minimum wage. She said, this is what's in front of me in this moment, and I will bloom where God has planted me in this season. I'll start where I'm at. I'll use what I got, and I'll do what I can. And when I finish, I'll do a little bit more. See, all of us want this overnight success. All of us want to to be at the top of the food chain. But everybody who got there doesn't have a silver spoon in their mouth. Most of them were recognized because they were doing the job that nobody else wanted to do. And somebody walked up and said, I recognize who you are. You're a second mile. You're an and then some kind of person. I believe that God stops in his tracks when he watches us go the second mile. I believe it honors him. I believe he looks down and says, now that's a person I can trust If I can trust you with something that seems small and insignificant, I can trust you with something that's bigger. And we beg for something larger while we sit around and we complain about where God has got us. Start where you are at. Do what you can. That's all God's asking. Second mile kind of people. You know what that old girl didn't know? Those 10 camels were loaded down with saddlebags. Read it for yourself, Genesis chapter 24. For you who say the Bible is boring, you're reading reading the wrong books. This is awesome. The saddlebags were loaded with earrings and bracelets and gold and silver. These things weighed like, I don't know, the Bible said a talent apiece. So, I mean, they were like a lot of bling, bling hanging. It was awesome. But she didn't water the camels because she knew that. She had no idea that a multi-multi was watching her do something that seemed insignificant. And you have no idea when you're faithful in the calling that God has on your life, you have no idea who is watching you and how it's setting you up for success. Start where you're at. Use what you got. Do what you can. Never despise the day of small beginnings. Judged by her work standard. Most people would say it's not in my job description. It's not part of my portfolio. But next mile, people say it doesn't have to be. Second mile, people don't have to have it written down. They see it and they get get it done. Eleazar didn't judge her off her lips and her hips. He judged her off her work ethic. He said the girl is not only hot, she's not only beautiful, she'll work. You don't have to compromise beauty for work ethic, guy. You can get both. I believe that greater effort equals greater reward. Rich told us earlier, salvation is a free gift of God. And it is. But let me tell you something. It stops God in his tracks when he says, I see a person who is given more effort than anybody else, and I can't help but bless that. Say, well, Billy, give me some proof of that. Students that become valedictorians are the ones who stay and study when their friends are out partying. Olympians who are swimming in a pool are the ones who stayed and did laps after everybody else is at home and in the bed. Christians who leave the church on Sunday and say, I didn't stop living for Jesus at the last day, man. I'm leaving the building. I am being deployed to do the work of God because I am a second mile believer. I believe that effort matters. It matters in your marriage, doesn't it? Some of you got little kids at home, your wife's at home watching drunk little midgets all day long, pooping in their pants, throwing up. You walk in and act like she hadn't done anything. You go home, you do a little extra. Come night, you might get a little extra. See, I, I, I'm convinced, I really am. Extra blessing, huh? comes with extra effort. I got four kids. I'm a professional on this. This is is the word of God. Do you hear me? Some of us, if we would wake up in the morning and say, I'm not going to be the sorriest worker tomorrow. I'm going to be the one who gets the most done, who is the most productive, and I'm not doing it for a boss or a corporation. I am working as unto the Lord. You know what you just did? You set yourself up for the blessing of God. He stops in his tracks when he sees it. 
Matthew chapter 5, verse 41 says that when a man asks you to carry his bag, don't wait for him to ask you again. Carry it a second mile for him without him even asking. Scripture says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, that your righteousness should exceed that of the Pharisees. What does that mean? The Pharisees were rule keepers. They were clock watchers. They were just doing what was necessary. He said our righteousness should exceed that of the Pharisees. We should wake up and our hearts should be on the work of God. She had a lousy job. Watering camels. A lousy job. And as Christians, we think we can put a bumper sticker on our car. And win people to Jesus. Your testimony ain't worth a hill of beans if you're lazy at work. Now, I'm not trying to be critical of you today. I'm simply telling you that it gives you validity when you act right and you do right and you do what's expected and you go the extra mile. People will stop and listen. They'll say that person has and does what other people won't do. And I'll talk to you men today. You, you ain't, look, you ain't a man just because you got a zipper on the front of your britches. You may be born a male, but you make a choice to be a man. I believe that men have the authority in Scripture to lead, but we ain't leading a whole lot because we don't have enough really to put into the game. Women have been forced to step up, and God, I, I'm grateful for them. But men, listen to me. You can go the extra mile, and when you do it, you're setting yourself up for the blessing of God. If I had any advice for you today, it would be simply follow the God who goes the extra mile. He could have made one galaxy because this is all the human life we know exists unless you're a conspiracy theorist. But he made 60 billion galaxies instead. Why? Why? Because he's a second mile God. They asked Eisner, the CEO of Disneyland years ago, how is your campus, how, is your, how are your parks so clean? If you go to Six Flags, they put bubble gum on the trees and it just piles. There's no comparison. He said, how many people do you have working in maintenance? He said, 45,000. He said, no, 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 no. That's how many employees you have. He says, every one of them. If they're the first to see the paper on the ground, they're the first to pick it up. From the CEO to the janitor. What they're doing is raising up a group of people who understand the value of going the second mile. What if we, as the body of God, instead of just getting by, decided that we were going to be second mile people? Not to impress anybody but the audience of one. But it does get God's attention and it gets the attention of the people around you. Hey girl, what you going to do with them camels? Don't smoke them. Ride them. She was watering the camels in one moment. The next moment she's got bling bling from head to toe. And she's riding that camel back to Abraham's hacienda like it's an Escalade. I mean, bass bumping in the... She has just won the spiritual lottery. Why? Was it because she was good looking? Mm -mm. Was it because she had extraordinary talent? Nope. Was it because she was the valedictory? Nope. Was it because she came from the right family? No. It was because... She went the second mile, and it got the attention of Eleazar the same way going the second mile gets the attention of our father. It's a beautiful love story. You can kind of see it like a Fabio romance book. Isaac's in the field with his long flowing hair. He had pandemic hair. It's long and scraggly like ours. He's on his stallion, and he's riding his property. And he sees the silhouette of 10 camels in the distance. I can see him probably raise his hands over his eyes to get the sun out of his face and goes, there's Eleazar. Who, who is that? Hot, good looking. I hope that's who he brought home for me. Jumps off his horse, 
This is in Genesis 24. I'm not making this. Fact check me this week. Jumps off his horse, sprinting toward his woman. I mean, Isaac, the most eligible bachelor, sprinting. She jumps off of her camel. They embrace. It's beautiful. End of the story. She was a nobody going nowhere. But because she had a second mile mentality, stopped God in his tracks, set her up for the biggest blessing of her life. Don't shoot your camels. Ride them. I hate this job. Ride it. I hate this marriage. Ride it. I hate the relationship. Ride it. Because that which seems ugly in your life, that which seems overbearing in your life, may be the gateway that opens to the biggest blessing you have ever experienced. 17 years ago, Harper Street, downtown Zebulon, we bought a 6,000 square foot palace. Do you hear me? We thought we were in church heaven. A lot of people said we wouldn't make it. They didn't understand we had a second mile mentality. People ride by now and stop in this place that we're videoing at. And they act like maybe now you can take a break. No, now we got to go to third mile. There's no arriving in this thing called faith. If I seem hard this morning, I apologize for the tone, but I don't ever apologize for the content. Some of us need to quit being minimalist. And we need to start maxing out our effort. <laughs> Say, Billy, if you had to pick a team of ball players, nine baseball players, would you want all A's? A-class players, the best. Nope. I'll take B's and C's who come to work and swing the bat and run at practice and give all they got. I think that's why in Scripture, over and over again, we witness God using people because they were willing to give effort. David showed up at the front lines of the fight. Goliath is mocking God's people. David's brothers are trained in military uh, weaponry. They, they have all the experience. They have the, 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 they have the armor. Even Saul wouldn't touch Goliath. We think David had some kind of special mojo. No, David said, hey, I'm a second mile kind of guy. And if y'all want to stay on the first lap, that's fine. But if you'll get out of my way, me and my slingshot, we plan on doing some effort on the second mile. See, we want to make the biblical superstars, those characters that are so big, we want to make them be like they were something super special. No, man, they were willing to go after it. They were willing to stay late. They were willing to get there early. They were willing to have blisters on their hands and on their feet. They were willing to do whatever it took to go to the next level. If the church would just decide to be second mile people, this world could be reached instantly. She had no idea. That beautiful young lady. She's going to marry Isaac, live in a palace, have all the bling bling that she wanted. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Ultimately, New Testament, Jesus. She had no idea God's plan for her. And neither do you. His plan is so big that if he exposed it to you at one time, you wouldn't be able to sleep tonight. He didn't save you to keep you in a small world with small thinking, doing small things. Break out of the box. Go 
the second mile. Jesus, if there are areas of our life where we've turned into minimalist, where we secretly in our mind know we're not putting the effort in, but outside we're trying to act like nobody will notice. You know our hearts. You know our intents. So I ask people who are watching today and people who are in the building with me right now, do we have the spirit of the second mile when everybody else quits, will we stay in the game? When everybody else says it's too hard, we say, no, 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 nothing's too big for God. Can we take on that spirit? For the people who have decided that in their life the best days are behind them, would you just take that thought process away from them? Our best days are not behind us. Our best days are out in front of us. The biggest harvest for the church is right out there in front of us. COVID-19 and Corona can't stop the worship and the spreading and the evangelism to Jesus. This is the church's hour. This is the church's time. It's time for us to stand. It's time for us to believe deeper. It's time for us to grow stronger. Second mile. Get ready. The church is coming. Second mile, get ready. We're on our way. I pray those things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, and you are my portion, and you are my hiding place, and I believe you are the way, the truth. Thank you. 
Yes, Lord. I believe you are. Yes, Lord. Guys, we have had an incredible time worshiping with you this morning. If you've made a decision to follow Christ, would you please put that in the comment bar and somebody from our church staff will contact you. If you're in Cochrane, thank you so much for tuning in. Your pastor, your campus pastor, Rich, done an amazing job this morning delivering God's word. All of our Zeblin folks and Thompson folks and Griffin folks and Concord and Polina, I mean Molina, Meansville, thanks for tuning in. If I missed your city, I'm sorry, but we're so excited. Hey, two campuses is, is, is where we are right now, but... But we have a goal in the next 10 years to be in 10 locations. So if you have a prayer this week that you want to pray and say, hey, give me something to pray about, pray about that. We want to reach our area, our community for Christ and do that in 10 locations. That's kind of our goal in the next 10 years. I want to say a prayer before we're done today and ask God to bless you and your home and your family. So would you just bow with me there? Jesus, you are so good to us. We're so grateful to come together, even virtually, and worship. You are in this building and you are in people's homes and some of our church family who are on the job today who are listening in. And for the people in other countries and other states, we're hearing all kind of feedback. But you're everywhere, omnipresent. Would you bless every home watching in Christ's name? Amen. Hey, if you're a guest, thanks for signing in with us today. We would love for you today to give online. You can go to Breeze or... Somebody can give you some information if you just get in the chat bar. We love you at Christ Chapel. Have a fantastic Sunday.